Hop on over to Meyer for a happy Easter. We're serving up low prices on Easter favorites, like Meyer Spiral Sliced Ham for just 89 cents per pound. Limit one. Choose fresh sides, rolls, and desserts, and save on treats and toys. This week, earn 3,000 points for every $30 you spend on toys with M Perks. Get the same low prices no matter how you shop, and get more for your money at Meyer. Exclusion supply. See all the deals in the Meyer app. Welcome to episode 147 of Real Life Ghost Stories. To kick things off this week, I have a podcast promo for you. This week's podcast promo is the Possibly Paranormal Podcast. Scary locations are everywhere. Their history is intense. The stories of the hauntings will scare the pants off you. And the jokes made about them will put those pants right back on. Join Jake, Lisa and Davis as they explore these haunted locations, learning about their history, retelling some of the hauntings that people have experienced, all with a comedic twist. So I've been catching up on the Possibly Paranormal podcast this week and I am adoring the musical interludes. So every country is introduced with a musical interlude all about the history of that country and it is, it's, it's entertaining to say the least. So have a listen to their promo. If you like the sound of it, then make sure that you go and have a listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Greetings from our spooky dungeon basement studio here in Minneapolis. My name is Jake. I'm Lisa. And I'm Davis. And we are the Possibly Paranormal Podcast. Um, it's Pride Rock. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't know. Is, um, isn't that from the Lion King? Yeah, I... <laughs> What's the think? Pilgrim Rock one? Uh, Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock. <laughs> you guys remember uh, when oh, yeah. America was discovered by the Germans <laughs> off the Mayflower when they landed on Pride Rock? Each week, I give Jake and Lisa a different location where they need to tell me about the history. One Halloween night <gasps> in 1949, Whoa. Governor Youngdahl sets fire to a bunch of stray jackets to show, show like almost a weird oh, type of protest. Oh, you made that so... <laughs> I was like, a governor doing fires? The scary stories. Encounters to Grandpa have been proven to be extra scary because he's just not any ghost. He inhabits as a well-preserved corpse, nicknamed Old Whitey, that they remain trapped on this drowned ship. See this body following them. No. Wait, as, they as dive the through. corpse, not <gasps> as, just like... As a, the corpse. The corpses? No, the corpse oh! is... No. The corpse is legit. Uh-uh. And all of this with a comedic twist. Now I present to you all an ode to Foghorns. If you like learning unique history, or getting goosebumps from spine-tingling first-hand accounts of the paranormal, or maybe you just want to play a game or listen to a song, then you'll love the... Possibly... Paranormal... Podcast! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh. Uh, no nope, mining. Water. What? <laughs> <laughs> and our film review this week. Our film review is The Unholy. The Unholy was released in 2021. It has 5.2 out of 10 on IMDb and 26% on Rotten Tomatoes. A disgraced journalist investigates a girl who can inexplicably heal the sick after a supposed visitation from the Virgin Mary. However, when strange events start to occur, he soon wonders if these phenomena are the result of something more sinister. This film is based on the novel Shrine by James Herbert and I was really looking forward to watching it. In fact, I was so looking forward to watching it that I signed up to Now TV in order to be able to watch it. And you know what? I was sorely disappointed. I was incredibly disappointed with this. I avoided any reviews or spoilers about the movie until I watched it today. And honestly, it's not a good one. It's very disappointing. So things I liked about the movie, 
Jeffrey Dean Morgan plays the obnoxious protagonist and I think in a horror film the obnoxious protagonist has become a bit of a trope so he's a disgraced journalist he likes a drink and he is kind of sneery he is sarcastic but he's a good character and he seems to really have a good time playing the character that he is playing Jerry Fenn and I enjoyed him I enjoyed watching him I thought hey you are good I also thought the girl that played Alice who is a girl called Cricket Brown which I mean, what an incredible name. I also really enjoyed her performance too. I thought she was very good and very earnest in the role. The story itself is a solid story. I don't know how true it is to the novel. I've not read the novel, but it's a good story. You've got this girl who seems to have powers that are given to her from the Virgin Mary. She has the ability to heal the sick. She is healed herself. She was deaf and mute and she suddenly starts speaking and is able to hear and then she meets a boy in a wheelchair and she gives him the power to be able to walk again and she she attributes all of this to the Virgin Mary and there are good references in the story to other historical times when the Virgin Mary was supposedly seen and miracles followed so for example they talk about Lourdes they talk about Fatima they talk about Medjugorje which are all places of pilgrimage in the Catholic Church in particular because the Virgin Mary is said to have appeared there. So I thought, wow, like this is interesting. This is a great story and there's a real darkness to the story too. And we do know that historically people who have claimed to have the ability to heal are not always who they say they are. I'm personally very interested in stories about people who claim to have the ability to heal, about miracles, about how the Catholic Church in particular accredits miracles as being real or not real. I found that whole storyline had the potential to be really fascinating. Another thing that was interesting was that throughout the film, there were subtle nods to everything not being as it would seem. So, for example, throughout the film, Alice calls the Virgin Mary or this vision of Mary that she sees the lady rather than our lady. Traditionally in the Catholic Church, the Virgin Mary is referred to as our lady, whereas Alice always refers to to her as the lady. And when she first started doing it, I thought, oh, that doesn't sound right. That's interesting. So that was a, a cool, clever little piece of writing. However, that was where my likes stopped and my dislikes are significantly longer. I don't think they did this film or this story any justice whatsoever. I did think it was peppered with lots of horror movie cliches and tropes and actually relied way too much on jump scares to make it a horror film at all. While they could have had a really interesting, slow-burning, atmospheric, creepy film like along the lines of The Witch or even the film St. Maud that came out recently. They didn't do that. Instead, they relied on this really Hollywood idea of a horror film, which relied on, frankly, really bad CGI. It's 2021. I don't know if there's an excuse for having CGI as bad as it was. And along with the bad CGI came that particular Hollywood trope of making the creatures move in that crawling, disjointed, breaking their limbs, sort of leg over shoulder and then arm over leg kind of way, crawling along the ground like an insect. And you know what? I'm going to be really frank. I'm sick of seeing it. Give me a horror movie monster or a horror movie ghost that just walks along. Every single horror movie ghost in Hollywood does not need to do that crawling thing complete with the noises of bones cracking especially when it's done badly with bad CGI. I thought elements of the story were incredibly rushed and incredibly muddled and thrown in to to make everything so up nice and neat in a little bow and it became very predictable. I'm pretty sure most people who watch this if you're a horror movie connoisseur you could predict within the first 15 minutes exactly what's going to happen throughout the film. So in general, it's only okay. It's full of predictable jump scares. It moves at a pretty decent pace and it's got a solid story. However, it does become cliched and very Hollywoodized in a way that I think takes away from the story itself. So would I recommend that you watch it? Actually, genuinely, probably not. But it did make me want to sit down and read the book. So that's something. I'd probably give this film maybe two and a half out of five at a push.
I would recommend maybe if you're looking for an atmospheric, religious themed horror film to watch the movie Saint Maud. Although it's not necessarily a horror in the traditional sense, it's a very interesting film and it does, I think, what this film could have done if they took the time to make it just a little bit more atmospheric. But it did teach us a very good lesson. And that is, if you find a creepy old porcelain doll with creepy old writing on it, wrapped in creepy old rope, in a creepy old tree in the middle of nowhere, don't break that shit open. No good can come of it. Today's episode is sponsored by HelloFresh. Now, look, I know I've been doing fun, silly ads for HelloFresh at the moment, but I thought I needed to do at least one ad where you could really get an idea of what HelloFresh is all about. Did you know that March is National Nutrition Month and HelloFresh makes it easy to choose delicious dietitian approved meals. Simply look for the dietitian win tag on their menu choices for meals with under 700 calories and with one third less sodium. And those aren't the only options. So you can choose quick cook. You can choose that your box is family friendly, carb smart, protein rich, vegetarian, pork free. There are so many different options to choose from. HelloFresh sends you seasonal recipes that come with ingredients already pre-proportioned. So all you have to do is cook and enjoy. And I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm not a good cook. It's not something that comes naturally to me, but let me tell you when I'm getting HelloFresh, I, I feel like I feel like I'm Gordon Ramsay, you know? I'm taking pictures of every meal and I'm sending it into the group chat. To be honest, HelloFresh is one of those things that I'm always going to recommend whether I'm advertising for them or not. It's quick, it's easy, it's great for people who maybe aren't very good cooks like me. It's cost effective and it also saves on a ton of waste. So go to HelloFresh.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Stories 60 and use the code Real Life Ghost Story 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. That's HelloFresh.com forward slash Real Life Ghost Story 60 and use the code Real Life Ghost Story 60 for 60% off plus free shipping. Today's episode is sponsored by HERS. This time of year, all of the emphasis is always on organising your space, it's always on wellness, it's on spring cleaning, it's on fresh starts. But actually, the most important way to take care of yourself is to take care of your mental health and you can do so at forhers.com. At forhers.com you can get access to real medical providers who can prescribe trusted anxiety and depression medication if it is right for you. The process is 100% online including unlimited check-ins, provider messaging and support along the way. Plus to make things even simpler you can get your first month of treatment for just $25 if prescribed. To get started, go to forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers.com slash spring. And I know for some people that getting access to proper mental health care can be a serious source of stress in and of itself. It also can be really difficult to talk to healthcare providers face to face about things like your sexual health, about things like hair loss and about things like your mental health. That is why HERS makes it simple. Get started today at forhers.com slash spring. That's forhers, F-O-R-H-E-R-S dot com slash S-P-R-I-N-G. The offer is only available if prescribed. Prescription products require an online consultation with a healthcare provider who will determine if a prescription is appropriate. The subscription is required. Additional restrictions apply. See website for full details and important safety information. And now, a special motorcycle weather report from Progressive. Well, today you can expect lots of cloud cover with 0% chance of raining on your parade because you'll be riding your motorcycle vroom vroom. That rumbling low-pressure system beneath you should give way to a relaxing commute and the sudden urge to take the scenic route everywhere you go because, dang nabbit, you're having fun out there. That's your forecast. Back to you. This has been a special motorcycle weather report from Progressive, where every day's a beautiful day to ride with coverage from America's number one motorcycle insurer. Get a quote today and see what you could save. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. So the idea of just leaving stuff alone leads nicely into our story this week. And our story this week is one of the most requested tales that we have had since the dawn of this podcast. And there is history with this story and it's going to take us to various places. So what we're going to do is briefly break down the historical bit first and then we're going to get into the ghost stories. So let's get into it. Ireland is very green. 
No, really, I know it sounds like a cliche, but it always strikes me as I drive through the countryside that it's just very green, and it's a different sort of green. The other thing that stands out about the Irish countryside are the ruins that are dotted throughout the landscape. Peppered through the rolling hills are crumbling grey stone buildings, cottages, barns, and the remnants of old castles that exist side by side with modern houses. In some places, the remnants of the past are a stark reminder of the hardships that were faced by generations past. Deep in the Sleeve Bloom Mountains is a village, abandoned in the 1900s when each and every resident either died or realised that they just couldn't sustain life isolated up there. Each and every building holds its own story, some which have been lost to history, and there are others which are still told and retold and carry a veracity that has withstood the test of time. South of Dublin City at the foot of the Wicklow Mountains sits Montpellier Hill, There is archaeological evidence that Montpellier Hill was actively inhabited in the early medieval period, with some suggesting that there is evidence of earlier settlements here. If you're like me and you're not familiar with the numerology of named time periods, the early medieval period was around 476 AD to 1000 AD, so Montpellier Hill has been inhabited for an extremely long time. From the 12th century onwards, the Dublin Wicklow Mountains were a place of constant battle, as Gaelic forces used the hills and lowlands to mount attacks against colonial powers and would then retreat and hide into the mountains. Interestingly, Montpellier Hill and the surrounding land was owned by the Loftus family, the same family that owned the infamous Loftus Hall, and the land was sold to a man named William Connolly. Connolly was a prominent man in Irish society and was incredibly wealthy, and although no records show precisely when it happened, Connolly decided, against the warning of the locals, to build a grand hunting lodge on the top of Montpellier Hill. The locals knew that the hill was sacred. It had been inhabited for thousands of years, and they knew instinctively that building on it would invite retribution. Not only this, but the hill was a burial site, and its potential destruction frightened the local people. As is to be expected in these stories, Connolly was not in the least bit concerned about the superstitions of the peasants, and built his lodge, even using slabs from the ancient burial site to construct it. The local legend states that the old gods were outraged by the desecration of the land, and whipped up a storm to destroy the lodge. The roof was ripped off the lodge and the event served as confirmation for the local people. No good would come of this. And they were right, because William Connolly died four years later and the lodge became a place for a group of men to meet. The lodge would go down in history as the home of the Hellfire Club. For the longest time I thought the Hellfire Club was a thing of fantasy. I thought it was a moral tale of the dangers of having too much money and too little sense. But the Hellfire Club was a very real thing, although separating fact from fiction is tricky, as many of the actions of the club have been sensationalised over time. So it is important to outline, briefly, how the club started and what they actually did. Philip, Duke of Wharton, started the Hellfire Club in 1719, and it was a place where rich young men and women could drink and indulge in their hedonistic desires while simultaneously performing satirical religious ceremonies. The club held meetings on Sundays around London, and guests would come dressed as characters from the Bible. Eventually, the Hellfire Club was banned by King George I in 1721, but it continued around the UK for years afterwards. Essentially, the Hellfire Clubs were meetings of rich men and sometimes women who had mock religious ceremonies, drank in excess and had all of the sex that they wanted. As a side note, the oldest dining club in Oxford was originally a Hellfire Club and there are rumoured to be Hellfire Clubs at both Trinity College Dublin and Maynooth University. One of the important things to note here is that the Hellfire Clubs weren't satanic. We're often sold an image of rituals and human sacrifice but many of them were just drunk rich people who were anti-religion. Unfortunately, though, the Hellfire Clubs attracted some very unsavoury characters. 
men who had the dangerous mix of unlimited power, money and a thirst for violence. It would seem that the combination of individual hideous people and the sensationalising of the supposed rituals of the Hellfire Club created a history where truth and fantasy are interwoven. But there is no denying that heinous acts were committed by men who were proud members of the Hellfire Club. The Sheriff of Dublin, Simon Lutterell, was a prominent member of the Dublin branch of the Hellfire Club, and he was an all-round bad guy. Lutterell was literally nicknamed the King of Hell, and was alleged to have sold his soul to the devil in return for good fortune and riches. Interestingly, he did indeed have good fortune and riches, despite his reputation of being downright evil, and he outlived all of his Hellfire Club contemporaries. Lutterell famously accused prominent brothel owner Darkie Kelly of witchcraft and had her burned at the stake. And after her death, the bodies of five men were found in the basement of her brothel. Darkie Kelly, of course, wasn't actually a witch. And there are some that believe that she was actually pregnant with Lutterell's baby. And there's a growing body of thought that Darkie Kelly was helping the Hellfire Club hide the bodies of people they had murdered. In a biography, Lutterell was described as publicly and privately insulted and despised, in so much that it became a common phrase amongst the ranks of people and remains to this day that if a man was inclined to confer the greatest mark of rascality and resentment against his adversary, it was enough to call him a luttrell, traitor, villain, bastard, coward and profligate, and everything that be conceived odious and horrible were received, couched and understood in that one word. And Luttrell wasn't the only certified bad guy that frequented Montpellier Hill. Henry Barry, the fourth Baron of Santry, was a younger member of the Hellfire Club. He was apparently very civilised while sober, but was vile while drinking. Shockingly, when one of his servants was ill and bedridden, Santry force-fed him a bottle of brandy, doused the sheets in more brandy, and set the bed on fire, killing the servant. He escaped any prosecution through his wealth. The lodge was severely burned in a fire after a man named Burn Chapel Whaley became enraged after a servant spilled drink on him. He doused the man in brandy and set him on fire. While on fire, the man flailed around and set fire to tapestries that were hanging on the walls. The fire spread quickly and some of the members were so drunk they were unable to get themselves to safety. This generation of the Hellfire Club was disbanded soon after, but was reinstated by Burn Chapel Whaley's son, Buck Whaley, who continued and, according to some reports, ramped up the debauchery. Buck Whaley became convinced that the devil was creeping ever closer to him and eventually disbanded the Hellfire Club and fled to the Isle of Man. So I'm going to pause here briefly before we get into the actual ghost stories. There's so many interesting characters that I've already mentioned and if you're a true crime person, if you're somebody who's interested in older criminal cases the story of Darkie Kelly is really fascinating so her real name was Dorcas Kelly and she was referred to as Darkie because she had black hair it seems like she was really involved with the kind of upper echelons of society she was a brothel owner in Dublin a very famous brothel owner and reminded me of a lady called Peg Plunkett so there was a brothel owner in Dublin called Peg Plunkett who very famously became very wealthy because she would bribe all of the rich men that came to her brothel and she would say if you don't pay me what you owe me I'm going to write a big expose about you in my book and she used to write these books and she would expose people in her book she was a really interesting character and when Darkie Kelly was executed and she was executed publicly and viciously the sex workers that were around Dublin they rioted on the streets after she was killed because I guess there was a feeling that she represented the unfairness of it all that she had been accused of witchcraft there was no evidence that there was any witchcraft involved it is actually believed that she was pregnant with Lutterell's baby and he wanted, didn't want anything to do with it and then he said he sort of thought the easiest way to get rid of her was to say that she was a witch and of course her being a brothel owner and a sex worker meant that you know she wasn't afforded probably the same rights and empathy that other people would have been at the time so she's a really interesting character and the other really interesting character that's worth looking into is Buck Whaley there's quite a lot written about him and he was the ultimate playboy. 
too much money, not enough sense. And he spent his life taking part in these like increasingly wild bets. He was it seemed to have been a total adrenaline junkie and wanted to prove himself to be like the big man and survived on basically alcohol and doing these really big stunts. So there was one bet where he said, I can get to Jerusalem and back in two years. And off he went and did it. And then another bet, which is a lot more traumatic because it involves animals, but he bet that he could ride his horse out of a three-story window and survive. And he did survive. The horse didn't, but he survived. And that was how he lived his life. I think eventually he died from alcohol-related illnesses. Uh, He just is a really interesting character, so definitely worth a look into. When you look up the Hellfire Club, you get a list of all the awful things that people did. And then you look into it a bit more and you think, hang on a second, did the people in the Hellfire Club do these things or is it because people didn't like the Hellfire Club? And of course, Ireland at the time could have been considered a very religious country and the Hellfire Club was a a club that was inherently against organised religion. So I don't really think it was satanic. I think it was just a place where really rich people could just do whatever they wanted And there are very little records about what actually happened. But it is assumed that there was a lot of violence, both sexual and otherwise. And I think it can be assumed that genuinely a lot of terribly negative things happened there. We do learn about things about Luttrell, Santry, Book Whaley and their very violent, aggressive behaviours. So I wouldn't be too surprised if those violent aggressive behaviours were acted out within the walls of the Hellfire Clubs and during those meetings. And there seems to have been a huge amount of sexual violence. I mean, a lot of the Hellfire Club was all about sexual freedom. So in the hands of the wrong people, that sounds like it could be pretty horrific. And while I don't think the Hellfire Club was satanic, I do think there were very likely members who were actively into dark ritualistic things and were interested in other deities and entities. I know there was a particular member of the Hellfire Club, I can't remember their name, who brought back writings from Egypt all about worshipping other deities and other religious rituals. So I think there were probably people who were into some dark stuff. They used to say about Simon Luttrell that he was into dark magic. But there isn't really a reference as to what that means actively in his life or whether that was just because people couldn't understand his violent behaviour and they needed a way to explain it. The other thing that's really striking about this story is that building something on top of a Neolithic tomb is never going to be a good idea. And we've learned from every horror film ever that if the locals tell you something is a bad idea, it's probably a bad idea. And I know that the original members of the Hellfire Club in Dublin, they probably weren't au fait with horror movie tropes, with it being back in the 1700s and all. But it is never a good idea. And there's a lot of stuff about Neolithic people that we just don't understand and we don't know why they did things that they did or why they built things in the way that they did. And to be honest, especially as a burial ground where people take the time to have a ceremony or a ritual around somebody's death, Is it ever a good idea to disturb that? I don't think so. So let's get into the ghost stories. Maybe it was inevitable that anywhere the Hellfire Club went, ghost stories followed. They left an empty space at their table for the devil and toasted him at the beginning of every meeting. While this action was tongue-in-cheek, it still caused their meetings to be feared and shrouded in darkness. There are also very real reports that some members of the Hellfire Club took part in rituals that involved the torturing and killing of animals, with the members reportedly setting fire to a large cat and making it run down Montpellier Hill in order to terrify the local people. To this day, there have been frequent reports of a cat prowling around the hunting lodge, but the cat is huge, as big as a large dog, and in some reports it has glowing red eyes. There are those who believe that this cat is the physical embodiment of a demonic entity. In 1968, a lodge on the grounds of the Hellfire Club was taken over by an artist named Margaret O'Brien and her husband Nicholas, who was a retired superintendent. They had decided to open an art school and the lodge on Montpellier Hill was the perfect location, nestled in the mountains, under the watchful eye of the husk of the hunting lodge. 
When they moved in, they were warned by the locals of the reputation of the place, but they were unmoved by the fanciful stories. That was until Nicholas was out strolling on the land one day, and he spotted something moving through the trees, something large and black. At first he thought it was a large dog, but as his eyes focused on the creature, he realised that it was a cat. Big, black and svelte, moving silently through the trees. He was completely shaken up, and one of the people that lived on the land went to retrieve a shotgun, thinking a large animal was loose. He couldn't locate the creature, and decided that it was best not to tell anybody else. He had scoffed at the stories of the locals and now felt foolish having had the creature present itself to him. It wasn't until December 1968 that he felt compelled to reveal what he had seen on that day. It was late in the evening on the 10th of December and Nicholas, two workmen and the artist Tom McCasey were working in Killakee Lodge doing renovations to the building. While working, McCasey had bolted shut a large wooden door to keep the cold December air at bay the best that he could. As the four men worked, they noticed a distinctive change in the atmosphere. The room was cold already, but the air suddenly felt heavy. It was thick and oppressive, and it felt harder to breathe. They all heard a noise, a slow metallic scraping, and they realised that it was the bolt lock on the door. It was slowly unlocking itself until the door swung open. Together the men ventured into the dark hallway to try and see what had opened the door, and they were met by a huge dark figure, shrouded in a cloak. In a low guttural voice, the spectre said, I can see you. You can't see me. Leave this door open. The men fled, and as they ran, turned to see if the creature was following. But it was no longer there. In its place was a large black cat with glowing red eyes. The O'Briens now recognised that something was wrong in their house, and that the locals had been right. They called a priest to perform a blessing on the house, and the hauntings calmed down. That was until one night a group of actors who were staying at the house decided to conduct a seance in jest. It would appear that this seance reignited the paranormal activity. In 1970, newspapers reported that Killakee House was under attack from fierce poltergeist activity. Doors opened and closed of their own accord. The phantom cat was seen lurking throughout the house and in the garden. Items, in particular hats, would appear and disappear at random throughout the house. A hat could disappear completely from its allotted place and reappear later in a locked room hanging on a picture hook. Cups and plates were smashed and the O'Briens began to see apparitions of nuns floating through the corridors. They began to see the apparition of a small man limping through the walls. The O'Briens were constantly renovating the house throughout this time and eventually pulled up the kitchen floor. And underneath the floor they found human remains of what they believed initially to be a child, buried with a brass figurine of a devil. On further investigation, it was revealed that the bones were not that of a child at all, but of a fully grown man with dwarfism. The O'Briens had the remains properly buried and had a priest come and bless the house, and the hauntings stopped. More recently, in an interview with an Irish newspaper, Tina Barco revealed that the Hellfire Club was one of the most terrifying places she had ever visited. Two things happened there on separate nights that I haven't been able to explain, and that absolutely terrified me. We were up the Hellfire one night, a group of eight or ten of us. At around 1am we went in and put the equipment on the floor. Vibration sensors and electromagnetic spectrum equipment. And we know up there there is no electricity. We stood in a circle, and the next minute there was a thud. It was like a vibration went through the whole building, and the equipment went mental. One of the guys was in the hall, and he is a cynic, and he said a black shadow crossed him. A tall, black shadow. Another guy started getting sick, and then a girl said she heard a whisper in her ear, very clear, and it just said, Get out. 
all in the course of one minute, chaos. That was the first time I ever called an end to the night and said that we didn't feel safe. So while the Hellfire Club has been one of the most requested stories on the podcast, there seem to be very few modern ghost experiences that have happened there. Legends abound, of course. People allegedly hear screams of torture victims from the hill at night time. There is a story of a local man becoming curious as to what was happening on the hill and trying to sneak a look at the Hellfire Club. He got caught by the members who dragged him inside and the horrors that he saw rendered him speechless for the rest of his life. There is the story of the father who went to the lodge looking for his daughter. The members of the club had kidnapped her, brutally assaulted her and stuffed her in a barrel and the sight made the man's hair turn white instantaneously. A priest was alleged to have also snuck up to the lodge to see what was really happening up there and witnessed the members attempting to sacrifice a giant cat. The priest intervened and conducted an impromptu exorcism at which point the cat was ripped to pieces by an unseen force. There were also rumours that the Hellfire Club members would kidnap vulnerable members of society with the intention of torturing them. It's difficult to sift through the fact and the fiction in the Hellfire Club stories, what is actually historically factual and what is born of fear and folklore. What is absolutely true is that there was an ancient cairn with underground tombs and passageways and the hunting lodge was built on the site with stones from the burial site being used. The roof was blown off soon after its construction and was rebuilt in stone. The Hellfire Club existed, but how much of their activities took place on Montpellier Hill is up for debate. Some of the men in the Hellfire Club were indeed violent and notorious murderers whose money and connections allowed them to escape justice. Today, the Hellfire Club is used for secret raves and teenagers illicitly drinking, but also for rituals, with Ouija boards, animal heads and candles being found on the premises. Hooded figures have also been seen on the hill performing rituals, although whether this is younger people exploring ideas around witchcraft and spiritualism or an established group is anyone's guess. Building a hunting lodge on top of an ancient burial site is probably not a good idea in general, And perhaps if you believe that the lodge is haunted, maybe that's the reason why, rather than the activities of the Hellfire Club themselves. It could be argued that the subsequent and modern use of the site as a place for spiritual and ritualistic activities has brought something to the land. It's hard to say, but maybe we'll get more conclusive answers in next week's episode. Because it's a two-parter! I haven't done a two-parter in a really long time. So for the second part of this episode, we're going to be travelling to the Hellfire Caves, which are another home of the Hellfire Club, apparently notoriously haunted. And I'm really excited to see if there's any more solid ghost stories from there. So in looking for substantial ghost stories for this episode that people have experienced recently, I really struggled I have to say, I really, really struggled. So I was reading a book called Haunted Dublin by a guy called Dave Walsh and he wrote about the Hellfire Club and that was where I got the information about the O'Briens and he wrote about the Hellfire Club quite cynically so he didn't really think it was haunted at all, it would seem. And then I trolled Reddit trying to find stories of people maybe who'd been to the Hellfire Club and had experienced stuff and a lot of people wrote about going to the Hellfire Club and getting a feeling of it being negative or oppressive but not necessarily feeling anything or seeing anything that was substantial enough for a story. And then I had the thought to look on boards.ie which is a messaging board for Irish people and I found one singular story that I thought was a little bit creepy. So this is the final Hellfire Club story for today and it comes from boards.ie and it comes from the user Shuffles88 and the link as always will be in the description. I heard a story about the area where the Hellfire Club is. I don't know how true it is but it always gives me the willies. My friend's brother-in-law John was writing a story about the occult and was researching satanic rituals and things of that nature and happened to be talking to a priest and mentioned what he was doing, and asked him if he had had any experiences or thoughts on the matter, and the priest said to him, You should never look for the devil. 
because he'll take that as an invitation to find you and refuse to talk any more on the subject. So sometime later, John was driving from the Hellfire Club. It was the wee small hours and it was a nice clear night when suddenly a thick fog appeared across the road, so John slowed down. Not really knowing the roads well, he was crawling along, when suddenly the figure of a man in a bowler hat appeared running beside the car and banging on the window. It was shouting, Let me in! Let me in! But something about the way the man said it was threatening, and so spooked by this, John sped up as best he could, given the bad conditions. And when he looked, the man couldn't be seen anymore. And within seconds, the fog just lifted. Understandably creeped out, he was glad to get back to a more built-up area. He came to a stop at a traffic light. And just as the lights turned green, and he started to round the corner, he saw on the wall the very same man in the bowler hat, who gave him a wink and a wave. And within the blink of his eye, he was gone. So maybe the Hellfire Club isn't haunted by the deeds of the Hellfire Club themselves. Maybe it's haunted by whatever you bring to it or the fact that, you know, rituals have been performed there for years. And whether those rituals are actively satanic, whether those rituals are actively dark or whether they are people being sort of satirical or naive, they still happen. So you never know what might have been stirred up up there. I also think... The bit in Tina Barco's story, so she's a paranormal investigator who doesn't have any kind of mediumship, psychic abilities, clairvoyance. She's not really into any of that stuff and is just interested in the paranormal. And in that same interview, she said, you know, 99% of the time when we go somewhere, everything is completely explainable. But there is 1% of the time where we don't have a scientific explanation for what is happening. And her story about the Hellfire Club really interested me because they were in a circle doing whatever they were doing. And then she said there was a thud that shook the Hellfire Club. And this is a huge stone building. And I thought that was really interesting because it almost is indicative of something like something ancient, something old, something like an old God kind of thing, rather than it being like a demonic entity. So I thought that was really interesting. It might be something totally natural too. Who knows? But maybe the building of something that is so frivolous on a sacred burial ground and years and years of rituals and all those years within the Hellfire Club of violence that happened there, Maybe that has, maybe that stirred something up. Who knows? Let me know what you think. And also let me know if you've had an experience of the Hellfire Club. If you have had an experience there and you want to let me know, please do, because I'm dying to hear about it. And if you are interested on YouTube, there is an Adrian Kennedy FM 104 phone show Halloween special. So the Adrian Kennedy phone show was a really popular radio show in Dublin in particular at back in kind of the 2000s. I don't know if it's still going because obviously I don't live in Ireland so I don't know if it's still going or not but they have a a three hour long Halloween special where they were taken blindfolded and dropped off basically in the Hellfire Club to spend the night over Halloween and it's very dramatic, very interesting probably an entertaining watch if you're Irish listening to this you'll be like oh my god you might even remember it so it's on YouTube I'll leave the link in the description but definitely worth checking out thank you so much for listening to today's episode if you would like to find out anything about Real Life Ghost Stories podcast you can do so by checking out our website reallifeghoststoriespodcast.com all of the links to where I got all of my information for today's episode will be in the description as always and on that note I shall see you next week
Hop on over to Meyer for a happy Easter. We're serving up low prices on Easter favorites, like Meyer Spiral Sliced Ham for just 89 cents per pound. Limit one. Choose fresh sides, rolls, and desserts, and save on treats and toys. This week, earn 3,000 points for every $30 you spend on toys with M Perks. Get the same low prices no matter how you shop, and get more for your money at Meyer. Exclusion Supply. See all the deals in the Meyer app. Purchase new wiper blades from O'Reilly Auto Parts today and we'll install them for free. See better and drive safer with O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts.